All right, my friends. Well, hey, we spent the last couple of weeks in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to kind of wrap that up today as Paul gets to the end of the letter uh, that he wrote to the church in Corinth. And he's trying to kind of center in on some really key, important essentials to the faith. And today, particularly, he's addressing uh, something that has become a source of confusion for the Corinthians. And that issue is resurrection. They're trying to, he's trying to clarify what we, what they, what we do and don't believe about resurrection. And so before we jump into that letter, I want to ask you, um, when you think or when you hear the word resurrection, when you think of resurrection, what comes to mind for you? Just kind of shout some of those things out. What comes to mind for you when you hear resurrection? New life. Grace. Hope. Love. Jesus. Anything else? Joy. Peace. Okay. Patience. And somebody's now, we're, in, we do, we're doing Fruit of the Spirits on Wednesday night, and Jamie, know, he clearly knows them. Nice job, buddy. All right, so, guys, um, resurrection, what's that all about? The second question around this, though, is why is Jesus' resurrection so essential to our faith? Why is that so, so important? Forgiveness. Okay, that's something to do with forgiveness. If there's no resurrection, is there forgiveness? Okay, what, why, why is resurrection so important? Overcome death. If there's not resurrection, then there's not eternal life, right? There's not an overcoming of death. That's kind of an important thing, right? Okay. Any other thoughts about why resurrection is so important or essential to our faith? Okay, it has to do with the deeper connection with God. It's not just this life. Somebody else was starting something. Sets you free. Ah, second chance. So uh, the idea of new life also has something to do with second chances with new opportunities. Uh, new life, I like it. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, we're going to jump into this today because Paul, I think, has some important things to say. And um, for us, I want you to be thinking today about resurrection and why that matters, why it's important, what it's all about. And I'll just say that on a day like Mother's Day, okay, for a lot of us, we are thinking about women in our lives who are important to us who are no longer with us. And on Mother's Day, we really feel that, and that can hit hard. And so today, we're celebrating the good news of resurrection. This is a gospel of life. And if you find yourself um, in, in some places of grief today, hear these good words about resurrection, okay? So let's dive in the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, Paul says this. He says, friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy, that you're in this for good and holding fast. So Paul just sets the stage for this kind of conclusion to his letter by saying, okay, we're going to go over this one final time. I'm going to kind of, I'm going to get to what really matters here. I'm going to get to the core of our faith, what this is all about. And that's, he says, this is what you've heard from me, what you've set your life on. And by, way, by the way, I do believe that it wasn't just kind of a passing fancy, but it's actually something that you are staking your life on. It's actually something that you're holding fast to. And today I'm going to challenge you in this idea of resurrection. What are, what are you staking your life on? What are you holding fast to? Is resurrection central to our thinking about life and the hope and the joy and the peace that we find in this life? So Paul is saying... Let's, let's review what's really, really essential and important here. So he goes into verse 3 and he says this. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me. That this, that the Messiah died for our sins, exactly as scripture tells it. That he was buried, that he was raised from death on the third day, and again, exactly as scripture says. And that he presented himself alive to Peter and then to his closest followers, and later to more than 500 of his followers all at the same time, most of them still around, although a few have since died. That he, spent, that he then spent time with James and the rest of those he commissioned to represent him, and that he finally presented himself alive to me. It was fitting that I bring the, up the rear. I don't deserve to be included in that inner circle, as you well know, 
having spent all those early years trying my best to stamp out God's church right out of, out of existence. Okay, pause there. So Paul has a lot to say here. At the end, you remember the story of Paul. He says, I, I don't even deserve to be included in this because uh, in my earlier life, I was, um, I was out to stamp out the church. And remember the story, Paul's name was Saul originally. That was his birth name. And Saul um, hated Christians with the passion. So this man who wrote a lot of the New Testament at first hated Christians with the passion. And so as he's recounting what Jesus did and what's essential, he said, and yeah, um, man, I don't deserve at all to be included in this list of people who Jesus showed up to. But of course, what we know is when Jesus showed up to him, it changed everything for Paul um, and is why he's doing the work that he's doing here. But Paul goes over the main, the basics, right? What did he say? He said, here's, here's what it is, that the Messiah died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised from death on the third day. And then he says, he presented himself alive to Peter and then his closest followers, and then to 500 other people. And he makes the note, of course, when he's writing this, he says, most of those people are still alive today. You can go ask them for yourself, although a few of them have passed. And so Paul's making it as a reminder to these Corinthians that what he's what he's taught them, what he's told them, can be verified by witnesses, and not just one or two, but actually by hundreds of people who witnessed the resurrected Jesus, who interacted with him alive after he had, in fact, died. Now, this is all essential for Paul, because there's people in the Corinthian church who are talking about resurrection and saying, no, 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 resurrection isn't real, it doesn't really happen. And so he's trying to drive home the point that, yes, first of all, and first and foremost, Jesus, in fact, died and rose again. Now that also ha means a lot for us, and so we're going to get to that. But he's making it clear Jesus was alive, and he interacted with people. He presented himself alive. So now Paul goes on, after having then said, I shouldn't even be counted in this, um, we hear some of Paul's core theology, which is also really central to our theology, to Lutheran theology. It's grace, and this is what he says. But because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am. And I'm not about to let his grace go to waste. Haven't I worked hard trying to do more than any of the others? Even then, my work didn't amount to that much. It was God giving me the work to do. God giving me the energy to do it. And so whether you heard it from me or from those others, it's all the same. We spoke God's truth and you entrusted your lives. Now Paul always... Uh, this, is his, uh, this is his anchoring point, God's grace. And what Paul has very clear and deep in his theology that we carry forward with us today is Paul's starting point is, I am a sinner. That's his starting place. His starting place is, I do not deserve any bit of God's grace. I do not deserve a thing. But wow, God is gracious and merciful and generous. And he's accepted me. He's forgiven me. He loves me. And holy cow, he works through me. And so Paul says, you know, I, you all know all the work that I've done. You know how I have given my life away for this gospel. But it wasn't me. It was God. It was God working through me. It was God giving me the work to do, giving me the energy to do it. It was God. And one thing that we appreciate so much about Paul's perspective on life and theology is he understands that ultimately in this life, when we, when we, when we understand that Everything in our life is first and foremost a gift from God. And every way that God works through us, it's God doing it. Our job is to make ourselves open and available so that God can do the stuff that God's doing in this world. And Paul gets it. And so he says, friends, I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy. But by God's grace and generosity, here I am. God's working in me and through me. Okay, Paul has an eternal perspective and he understands that resurrection means that there, there is so much more to all of this. And now he's been set free. Brett said we're set free. He's been set free to give his life away, to serve. So we got God's grace, and now Paul's going to dive into resurrection, and he's going to hit home on why this is so important, why it matters for the Corinthians, why it matters for us. So in verse 12, he says, Now, let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there's no such thing as a resurrection? If there's no resurrection, then there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, 
everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications if there's no resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who've died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they're already in their grave. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemetery. Why is resurrection so essential to our faith? Paul just gets after it there, doesn't he? Now, um, today I use the translation from the message. Um, You know, I, I use that from time to time, and I love how he translated this text. And just, he makes it clear, doesn't he? Really simple, really clear. Boom, 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 boom. How in the world could we go about saying there's no resurrection? This is, this is the central piece to our faith. He says it's what we stake our lives on. It's what we stake our lives on. He says if all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. So now here's where I want to challenge you a bit on your faith, on your perspective about why we do this, what this is all about, and how it impacts your life. Because if we're just here to just get a little, a little something to make it through the next week, go listen to a podcast. Go find a self-help book. That'll give you a little something. Paul is saying, this is what we stake our lives on. And when we stake our lives on this, it changes everything. If we believe in the resurrection, that changes everything. I mean, think about how myopic our view gets so often. In this chaotic, crazy world, we are, constantly, we are constantly drawn away from what God is doing, and we're drawn into this little narrow focus of what's going on in our lives, and we get caught in the trap of all the things going wrong, and all the stress, and all the anxiety, and all the things. And, and we get overwhelmed, don't we? And we totally lose sight of the big picture of what God is doing and what God is up to. And Paul says, it's resurrection, people. We stake our lives on this because it means that this life is only the beginning. That at the end of the day, when you look at, at eternity, this little slice of life is nothing. It doesn't mean it's not valuable and worthwhile. It just means in the scope of things, we got to get a grip. And so this good news of resurrection means we can live with hope and joy and peace. We are set free to not get caught up in all of this and instead go, wait, this is all a gift and I've got eternity waiting for me. Now how do I get to use what's in front of me? How do I get to spend my days? How do I get to bless others? How do I get to jump in on this gospel of life and be a part of the life that God's giving to this world. Instead of holding on so tightly to mine and so fearfully and, and, and being just stressed all the time, I am set free. I am set free to love and bless, to trust and know that God has got me, that God has got it, all of it. This faith of ours is not about just a little bit of inspiration to get us through the week. It's about a life-changing perspective That God's got it. This life is not all there is. There's some, I think for me, some profound pieces coming up. And first, a little chunk. And then we're going to get into this last bit that for me hits hard today. But this is what Paul says in verse 21. He says, there's a nice symmetry in this. Death initially came by a man. And resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam. And everybody comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn. Christ is first, then those with him at his coming. The grand consummation, when after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down. 
And the very last enemy is death. And so Paul just reminds us that, hey, as a human being like Adam, we are sinful people. As a human being like Adam, we are slaves to sin, and we create brokenness in this world. But as believers in Jesus, we are made alive again in Christ. Everybody comes alive in Christ, and we are given new life. We are given resurrection. We are given freedom from sin and death. And so he says, Jesus won't let up until the last enemy is down. The last enemy is death. And so Paul presents Jesus to us as the victor. The victor over the powers of sin and death. The victor, all these things that we we allow to entrap us all the time. Paul says, Jesus is the victor. And because Jesus is the victor, so are we. We are victors in Christ. We are victors over sin and death. So we move into this last part. And the reason I say this hits hard for me is because this passage we're going to read now is something that is part of our burial liturgy. And so when we arrive at the place of burial, usually at a, at a cemetery, I stand between a grieving family, near a grieving family, and the casket. And standing at the head of the casket, I am tasked to proclaim these words. These are words of life. They are words of hope and peace. And when they're proclaimed at the graveside, they are not just meant to fill the space or fill the time. They're meant to remind us that we are people who grieve with hope. That we are people whose lives go well and way beyond this place. That this world is not all there is. And so it's my hope that in hearing these words today, I can take on a new meaning for you of what's happening in death and what happens at the graveside. These are words of hope and peace. And so this is what Paul says. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, Where is your sting? No, for sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, today we, we recognize that everyone dies in Adam, and everyone comes alive in Christ. This is the gospel of life. That Jesus died for your sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And in so doing, he conquered the powers of sin and death. This isn't meant to just be a little bit of inspiration to get you through the week, but it's something to stake your life on. Everybody comes alive in Christ. And so on this day, we celebrate the gospel of life, that our God is a God of life. Our God is a God who comes into our death, into our brokenness, our destruction, our pain, our suffering, and he brings life. And then he says to us, and you will be with me forever. You will rise again. You will be with me always. So friends, what do you stake your life on? What is it in your everyday life Where do you plant your flag? Where do you say, this this is the mountain I'm going to die on right here. This is what it's all about. Because if, if we really believe the resurrection, then it changes how we look at life each and every day. And all the stuff that we find ourselves being bombarded by, being overwhelmed by, being trapped in, that stuff can disappear. It can disappear when we claim this good news 
as the place in which we stand. You and I, were made alive together in Christ. And not only have we been blessed with the life here to live, but we will live forever. That is good news. Let's pray. Oh God, forgive us for all the ways that we lose sight 